Strange things are afoot at the Circle K. That kid is back on the escalator again! Hand on her. Is my boomstick! Oh! Game over, man! Game over! Welcome to The Bargain Bit. He is your host, Ben Mason. And he is your co-host, Sandra Lukedic. And today we're talking 1997's Snowboard Academy. Normally, a spoiler warning here, I don't think anybody cares. Because no one's seen this movie and no one's going to. And that's fine. It's, it's actually available fully on YouTube. Is it? Yeah, and nobody is bothered to, like, copyright or strike it down or anything. So, yeah, I don't think anyone cares. <laughs> hey, man, Stone Cold is on there, too. And that movie's great. But... There's one thing that I thought you would find funny about this movie if you did a little bit of research, specifically on one of the writers. Come on, man. A writer? <laughs> well, he also acts in this movie. James Salisco is one of the co-writers. He plays Dennis, the bartender. Okay. He has written this movie and one other movie called She's Too Tall, starring, you guessed it, Bridget Nielsen. And Corey Feldman. This guy has written two movies, each of them starring one of the Corys. I don't know what I'm supposed to take from this information. <laughs> Nothing good. <laughs> Nothing good. Um, I'm not saying it's an amazing achievement. I just like it. All right, then. <laughs> but we, we came up with the idea of covering Snowboard Academy because we wanted to do something a bit lighter. And we are talking about doing something like Rad, you know, the uh, community coming together or like a sports movie in a small town. And this is one of the options that we looked at. And I have seen this movie numerous times growing up. Uh, I own the VHS. I watched it with my best friend at the time, Matt Murphy. Uh, we loved it. We knew it was bad. We knew it was really bad. Um, but I haven't seen it in a very long time. And you know me and Corey Haim. I love this guy. He was amazing to me. Oddly enough, I don't know if I'd call this a Corey Haim movie because he's really not in it that much. No. No, he is a supporting character. It is more, I believe you said you found a review or a comment on the movie. Mm -hmm. That felt a lot more accurate. Yes, and the reviewer called it Ernest Go Skiing. Yes. But we agree that this is definitely not an earnest movie. It's just Jim Varney doing his comedy. No, it's, it's absolutely not. He's not wearing the hat. But it is <laughs> more an earnest movie than it is a Corey Haim movie. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, did you have any history with the film at all, or is it just something that came up and I picked it? Um, no history whatsoever. I googled uh, movies like Rad, and this was one of the ones that came up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got had, man. Oh, no, sure, sure did. <laughs> I've seen the better version of this movie before. I own the better version of this movie. <laughs> it's, um, I don't think we're going to surprise anybody here. It's not, it's, it's not good. Mm -mm. Um, Quite frankly, if you're thinking about watching this movie, just watch 2001's Out Cold instead. No, no, this is fun. <laughs> this is fun. It's just, it's just really bad. You know what else is really fun? Your game? I'm playing my game. Yeah, I'm pretty nervous about this one. Okay, we got three and a half. Okay, I think I've got the three. The half, I don't know. The half, I don't expect you to know. Okay. Uh, Jim Varney? Of course. Ernest Scared Stupid. That's right. Corey Haim? Mm-hmm. Roller Boys? Yep. Silver Bullet? Yep. Lost Boys? Got it. License to Drive? Did we do License to Drive? I think so. Yeah, we did. Okay. Yeah, we totally did. I missed that one. <laughs> Whose game is it now, bitch? <laughs> I didn't forget that he was in the movie. I forgot I that we covered that movie. <laughs> This is your job, producer man. Oh, now I'm the producer. Okay. You've been producer for a long time. Fuck Craig. Um, <laughs> <laughs> where's he been? 
Where has he been? He has no presence here anymore. I I don't don't have an answer for you, man. And Bridget Nielsen, Rocky Four. And fuck. Uh <laughs> oh, 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 uh Cobra. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Who's the half though? Uh Don Jordan. Oh, I don't know who that is. He played Greenwald. Who's Greenwald? That's a great question. I'm assuming it's one of the many other snowboarders or skiers in the movie because he's specifically named as a character. Oh, he's the um, the sports news host at the end. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, he was the main cop in Brain Scan. Oh, wow. Cool. But that's... That's a great movie. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't have a name either though he was just the no. cop <laughs> well Frank Langella killed that like he, he he stole every scene he was in in that movie yeah yeah <sighs> dude yep this is another weird one um again fond memories this had biodome level memories for me <laughs> it had biodome level quality for me no, it's nowhere near that status. Yeah, I guess it is much better. No. <laughs> but diving, diving in. Peaceful skiing mixed with harpsichord music as our intro, leading into snowboarding mixed with surf music. Immediately we know what they're doing. Skiing, accepted, classic, respected, snowboarding, crazy. No one wants it there. Whatever. Some fun stunts, though, I have to say. Um, <laughs> Why are they so against snowboarding? I don't know. It comes this up throughout is, the entire film. This is a question I had throughout the entire movie. I'm like, why? There's even a part where they're talking way later about how it brought in a lot of money. And it's like, yeah, what's the problem? People are afraid of change, man. It, it, it had the same view as skateboarding for a long time where it was just delinquents that would do it so let's ignore it and maybe it'll go away the backflips they do at the beginning here i i, I was inspired to try it because i was snowboarding at the time so i tried to do a backflip or what we call a satan flip it did not go well oh. i i managed to find the only exposed rock on the mountain with my face <laughs> and just <laughs> At the time, which Paul in this movie wears, at that time in 97, like 96, 97, for some reason, all the rage was wearing winter jackets that were yellow and black. Now, I don't know if you've bled all over yellow before. It stands out and it's very embarrassing. So that was me coming down half of the hill, face all bloody. You can tell from a very far distance of my jacket that I messed up something horrible. It was really embarrassing. But seeing these guys snowboard and, like, cut through trees actually had me on edge. I thought it was a pretty dangerous stunt to have, and it looked like they were the actual actors and not legit snowboarders. Well, you have to know that they're going to make it. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> if they had an accident like you and were bleeding all over their jacket, I don't think that cut would have made the movie. Yeah, no, no one's going to sunny bono themselves at the very beginning of the film. But basically, this group of four snowboarders are terrorizing this quaint ski hill. But right after this, we get what I would say is one of the best saving graces of this movie. And that is our introduction to Red Eagle 1. Ski Patrol and Head of Security. What are your thoughts on this guy? I can't stand this guy. Really? Oh my god, I love him. What what, it's what the way he talks? <laughs> do, you, do you remember the episode of Holliston we reviewed with pen cake? Yes, it's like that word for an entire person's dialogue. <laughs> it's so good though. No, oh no, it's fucking great, man. And even him, like trying to help the woman who fell over, he's like he's trying to hit on her, and at the same time, like he's so focused on his job that. He's trying to smooth talk her and the skiers fly by and he just screams at them and then tries to go back to it. 
the whole time he's like around here i am the law and he just has snot frozen to his face like he is such an embarrassment but he is so funny and i think it's because you have to be 100 percent open to making yourself look like a complete idiot for this role to work and i'm surprised you think it didn't because i thought he nailed this in the opening scene sure feel like it would have been just as good if he did it in a normal talking voice because it would have been the same annoying mannerisms i disagree man because this is his like one of his main character traits um but the snowboarders reappear led by chris barry played by Corey Haim, and the other three being slush katie and gordo torn on all these characters i like katie a lot gordo an odd french snowboarder like france french but this is filmed in Quebec, so I don't really know. And Slush, what what do you think about these three? Anything in particular? Uh, I don't think they're prominent enough to really have a problem with them. Okay, even Slush. Yeah, it's even just like, here's a few diverse characters that will have a few lines in the movie. Yeah. Okay, even if you don't like one, you're not going to see them enough outside of, like, just literally visually seeing them because they're often standing there, but they don't have that many lines or interactions that you can really get annoyed with any particular one of them too much. Yeah, they, they try and work them into the movie with small cutscenes, like Slush and his stoner subtitles, but I, I really did not like that character. I would have appreciated him not being in the movie. Katie and Gordo, fine. But, uh, for them now, it's time to fuck with Red Eagle 1. Uh, Gordo snapping the ski over his head seems absolutely ridiculous. It's a pretty expensive prank. Yeah. If that's what you want to call it. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't even know what they're doing or why they're doing it. And then they're surprised that Chris's father and, and brother, Paul, don't want them on the mountains. Because you're, you're, you're fucking ruining shit. <laughs> You're, you're, yeah, they don't even need to be on snowboards. They're just dicks. Yeah. But then we get our intro to Rudy James. Jim Varney, man. I miss him. But he arrives at the ski lodge reporting for his new job as the entertainment. And then we find out he has to wear multiple hats. Reporting for his new job? I felt like this was a job interview. It was, but it was basically like, this is an interview for a job that you're going to get regardless. No, okay. Yeah. We also meet Mr. Barry, played by Joe Flaherty, SCTV legend, and his eldest son, Paul. Uh, but I want to get back to Jim Vardy. What are your thoughts on Rudy here? I love him almost immediately. Really? Okay, I thought you would hate him more than Red Eagle 1. How? In what world is that even a possibility? Well, he's he's playing off the physical comedy a lot, and I don't really like it i thought you would hate it and his jokes are terrible yeah but they're supposed to be terrible they're not trying to pass them off as good jokes yeah but they're just one after the other it's a barrage that i thought you would find annoying almost immediately because it doesn't stop it's charming this guy is trying his best and just really bad at it what was the first part about him that won you over i don't know everything <laughs> the second he appeared on camera? No, I, I, I love that that's your reaction. I had no idea that's where we're going here. He, he walks into his, like, quote-unquote interview and makes a fat joke about his wife that he doesn't have. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, this is your icebreaker? <laughs> and, like, everybody's just kind of looking at him like, oh, come on. When the snowboarders take out Red Eagle 1, and he tries to break out his sick karate moves, I was already laughing out loud. The one of many black belts that he apparently has. <laughs> yes. But when they finally leave and he breaks out the walkie and he's like, come in, head cheese, that's Red Eagle 1. And Paul grabs the walkie and he's like, Red Eagle 1, this is head cheese over. It's Rudy's reaction. He's like, head cheese? Sold. Completely sold on the character. But yes, we learn that Chris is the youngest son of the Barry family, Paul the eldest. Um, 
and then we get right into Rudy's sight gags. And I have written right here, Rudy's sight gags are terrible. <laughs> what? No, it's fantastic. Okay, defend these. Well, first of all, did you notice the cover of his resume? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> it looks like my daughter colored it. <laughs> <laughs> He li literally has, like, a pencil crayon drawn image on the front of his resume. That <laughs> you gotta go back and look at it. It's I ridiculous. Will. And then he, he tells, um, oh, what's the eldest son's name? Paul. Paul. That he has a plant, and it's for his brain, because they create oxygen. And Paul's just like, it's plastic. <laughs> it's also a plastic weed plant. <laughs> But yes, Rudy has to wear a few different hats. His, I, it, oh God, the weird award trophy thing that he thinks is a snow globe. He's so excited about. Okay, that didn't land for me. No, exactly. Uh, like, where's the snow? <laughs> it's not a snow globe. Then not knowing how to ski, sure. Breaking that award. I don't know how he doesn't realize he's a phone cord wrapped around his arm and that he's wrapped it around the award. And I don't know. I did like the coffee maker bit, though. I don't know if you remember that. Of course. He tries to make the coffee. He ends up not having a cup and scooping his hands. And then when he pours it onto the plant, it just dies. Yeah, well, he didn't try to make the coffee. He accidentally turned it on. And when it starts brewing, first of all, who preps coffee and doesn't put the coffee pot in the coffee maker? But yeah, he's using his hands, which you think would be burning horribly, and they are. Sips at it, and yeah, kills the fake plant. The weirdest part about this scene for me is that this job pays $50 a week. Yeah. Plus free room and board and all the skiing he wants. Would you take that job? I don't know, maybe in the 90s. $50 ain't getting you anywhere. No, but if if I get to live there for free, you know. I guess. It'd be maybe. a fun kind of vacation. Yeah, like it would maybe be like a seasonal job that I would do one time just to, you know, yeah. live at a ski mount, but not for like a permanent job by any means. Although I, he is offered free coffee, <laughs> which he turns <laughs> down because he just had some. <laughs> Tell me that's not a good joke. Come on. It Oh, I can't. It is. It is a good joke. I, I can't deny that. Uh, the ski patrol chases the snowboarders. I have a question for you. <laughs> oh, this should be good. How tall is this fucking mountain? Um, Because they just I keep going. Yeah. And the tripwire bit. Did you find that odd at all? Uh, very. Why is this tripwire even, like, prepped and <laughs> hidden and ready to go? Why do they have this contraption? <laughs> yes, this was a ski to... pole. <laughs> Why? It's like a James Bond weapon. And that tripwire would fuck people up severely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a <laughs> dangerous <laughs> thing to do. Keep in mind, you're hitting it, and your, your feet are strapped to a single plank. Like, that's, that's going to break your ankle. Yeah. And how fast are you going? Yeah. That's a question, too, with this movie, is they seem to be flying at certain points, and then they do a quick camera cut, and they're going maybe a third of the speed. And you're like, well, it's, it's not really how it works, but okay. So, Ski Patrol catch up with Chris and Slush, and here we learn of the disdain the brothers have for each other. And at this point, like I'm, I'm sure Sandro can predict what the basic plot of this movie is from, from this point on. Yeah, although I'm still trying to figure out to this point why. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like that is a, a major problem. <laughs> they have a disdain for one another. It's like why? It's like yeah, okay. Chris is a bit of a goof off, but why? <laughs> why do you guys hate each other so much? Why is a great question for this movie. Because you can ask it at almost every plot point, and you will never get an answer. It's a mess. Have you ever seen a good ski movie? Yeah, oh, cold. Just referenced it. I don't like that movie. Yeah, well, go back and watch it again. Maybe. Ski School? No. Gutenberg? I think he was in that. should watch that, too. 
Surf movies for sure. I guess it's kind of the same idea, like except Point Break's awesome. So Paul is now general manager of the resort, and my only reaction is like, "Oh, great, more conflict that we don't need." And then a tour of the, uh, I guess it's the Chanticleer Resort. Two mountains, Sandro. Yeah. Mount Happiness and Cypress Hill. My next note says, I don't see any jokes coming from this. But nobody goes down number nine. No one goes down number nine. Number nine run? Nine mountain out of two? What's nine? Upside down six. All right, then. We get no Cypress Hill joke, which I was waiting for. We definitely get a Mount Happiness joke later, which we'll get into. Um, You'd think that one of the stoner guys would make a Cypress Hill joke. Fucking right. Okay, let's get into that now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you jumped on that. Fucking why? Why? Like, j one, one joke. We have Slush. He's the only stoner in the fucking movie. Have him make a Cypress Hill joke. There's no reference to rap music in this movie that I can remember. Make a Cypress Hill stoner joke. And they just don't. And I don't know why it infuriates me. But <laughs> Your expectations are too high for this movie, my friend. Expectations should not exist in this film. I understand that now. <laughs> exactly. Um, when Mr. Barry's taking Rudy up the hill on the ski lift, and... He just gives Rudy the walkie, being like, we need these. And he drops it immediately. It hits a skier on the head. Sounds like an old guy. So he grabs the other one and tries to get in touch with him, suggesting a tourniquet around the neck, which did make me laugh. See? See? His but, jokes are landing. But... Uh, the two things here. There's another one that's like, oh god, I hope you're not a bleeder. Like, that's pretty fucking funny. My note after that, though, says, dude, the torture I put you through already, I'm sorry. But you're enjoying this. Yeah, we'll see. Okay. Uh, Rudy is the safety engineer. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant to me. The dynamite bit. Do you remember the dynamite bit? Yeah, they mention how they set off dynamite. On the more difficult runs. Yes, on more difficult runs, they want to explain that they are doing controlled avalanches so that they don't have one on their own. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> but he's like, I guess that would make it a harder run. Yeah. <laughs> In his mind, they got to be dodging the dynamite when they're skiing. <laughs> and that's part of the writing that I love. Dynamite, huh? Yeah, we set it off on the more difficult runs. Oh, yeah, I guess that would make it more difficult. Oh, he's so good. Yeah, I think, okay, you're right. It's not the writing that's good. It's Jim Varney's ability to deliver poorly written lines in an actually hilarious fashion. He, he is the savior of this movie. Absolutely, 110%. Next up, we meet Dennis, the bartender. Um, anything you want to mention about this guy? No, I couldn't stand this guy. I liked him. He kind of reminded me of Kevin Smith in the Silent Bob role. Like, he was around just to kind of add a little bit here and there. But he's also the writer, so you know he put himself in for a reason. A selfish reason. I don't know what the point of this character is. Uh, it's stealing from the Save the Whales fund. And then making Rudy donate. <laughs> Even later in the movie, during the like the the races, he's walking around with that save the whale tin, just making people donate, and he's just pocketing all of the money. I thought it was kind of a fun running gag. What what's the point of this character? I don't know. All right. Voice of reason. Maybe. No, there's no reasoning here. Telling Mr. Barry that his wife was in. I thought that was pretty funny. Because Barry's like, yeah, she can be a little abrasive. He's <laughs> like, no, a belt sander is a little abrasive. That was a pretty good line. It's great. My next note just says, for as bad as this movie is, it has some pretty funny jokes. Which leads me into the part that made me the laugh the hardest of this movie. And now understanding your dis your, your dis <laughs> despite of, uh, of Red Eagle 1, it's his reading the directions to make mac and cheese. 
Oh, this scene is so annoying and it just keeps going. But we're going to insert it into this recording just so anybody listening who hasn't seen the movie gets what Sandra's talking about. This man's delivery, he hates. I think it makes the character completely enjoyable. Oh, you're just evil, but okay. Directions. Add macaroni to six cups of boiling salted water. Stir, boil rapidly, stirring occasionally six to eight minutes or until desired tenderness is reached. Roger. Drain. Add three tablespoons margarine, one quarter cup milk, and the cheese sauce mix. Stir well. Copy that. If a thinner sauce is desired, add two tablespoons of milk. Not a problem. So Katie gets the snowboards back after convincing Red Eagle that somebody is stealing all of the snow. <laughs> How stupid is this guy? <laughs> He's great. I don't know why you hate him so much. Like, we've been barraged with so many lame jokes, Sandro, that I'm actually finding them endearing now and legitimately laughing out loud. Even when the snowboarders post a flyer of him all over the place, of him holding up the snowboard, um, instead of ripping them down, like using his hands, his method is to press himself against the side of a wall and just run along it. <sighs> wow. You really hate all of this, don't you? I feel like you should have been the one making the Cypress Hill joke based on the condition you must have been in to enjoy this <laughs> Red Eagle character. Oh, he's so good. I loved him back in 97. I love him now. I, I, I don't get why you hate him so much. But moving on. Rudy's first sound check. <laughs> I knew you would like this. There's two lines in particular that okay. are like, this, this scene was written for Sandro. Hmm? Where are you folks from? Buffalo. Well, I had human parents. <laughs> Followed by him going up to the old, two old guys who are playing like chess. He's like, you guys look like you're having fun. And that one old guy just yells, fuck off, dickhead. <laughs> Not even my favorite lines in this scene. Oh, oh tell me, please. <laughs> it's what Joe Flaherty's like, we don't even have a mix. If I hear check one more time. Check, please. <clears throat> I didn't like that part. No, it was pretty airplane-y. And it was way too predictable because you knew immediately after you were going to get a bunch of the word check, and some yeah. of them were poorly delivered, especially the guy who's like, hey, look at those chicks. Or check out those uh, chicks or whatever. Terribly delivered. Yeah. But the whole just like, stop with the sound check. We don't even have a mixer. <laughs> so good. <laughs> I think it's Jim Burney's reactions to things like that that make the other actors successful in these scenes. He's so good that he plays up this facial expression like he's actually surprised by this information like he's caught off yeah. this this guy is so good i don't know what he what is he doing in this movie not making much money that's for sure i would love to know what he made for this because we'll get into it but it wasn't made for a lot of money <laughs> i'll tell you what he made for this movie <laughs> 50 bucks a week in room and yeah. I, I believe it. I totally believe that was his wage. But th this scene leads way for more bickering between the brothers. And later that night at the hot tub, we meet Mimi. So the first appearance of Bridget Nielsen. I can't stand her, man. In this movie, I cannot stand her. I don't even know if I really liked her that much in Rocky IV. Cobra, different story. What's your take on her in Snowboard Academy? I don't like this character. I don't, I don't really think we're supposed to like this character. Accurate. But even the acting I found bad. If she did just get married to not get deported at this point, why doesn't she just sign the divorce papers? Because she wants his money. And I'm assuming there was a prenup. Or she would get half of it. And half of nothing is not a lot. So if he keeps spending money, she's going to live like a queen. I think that's it. Yeah, she... Yeah. Seems pretty weak, dude. It is. It's such a tired trope in film. 
Like, I'm only staying married so I can keep spending the money. Whatever. I have to admit, though, she's looking different since the last time we saw her. <laughs> <laughs> should, should we leave it at that? Yeah, I think we should leave it at that. Oh, okay. Rudy's first show. What did you think of the bedazzler bit? He did another sound. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Fuck, man. To, to you, this guy can do no wrong. I don't get it. I, I'm praising Red Eagle One, and you're laughing over sound checks and bedazzlers. And... This time it's a subtle, very, like you just catch the tail end of his sound yeah. check, but it's like he didn't learn. He didn't. <laughs> But it's it's in this scene that makes me really interested in his character, and they they flop it real hard at face plants, because when he's when he's talking to Dennis, and eh, I'm immediately interested in this character because he just breaks the goofy gimmick, and it seems out of place in this movie as a whole, but it works so well. He asks if anyone is from out of town. Yeah. <laughs> and Bridget Nielsen or Mimi just says this is a resort everyone's from out of town <laughs> no shit how much of Rudy is a shtick and how much of him is actually him that we see on screen oh, I don't know because his, his breaking character here I'm like holy shit this whole thing is an act and this is a legit human being with real emotions who understands what he's doing and he's just playing a character but then he goes right back into the goofiness. Um, setting his arm on fire. <laughs> the best sight gag in the movie? Oh, yeah, by far. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> you see it, too, because, like, uh, is it Dennis, the bartender? He, he, like, squeezes some of the alcohol out of his sleeve so that you have it right in the front of your mind. Yeah. And then he goes to light the cigarette and lights his arm on fire. The best thing about this, though, is that Jim Varney's flaming arm carries into the next scene. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. That's a great way to use that joke. Well, they use it to transition to the other scene because he runs outside with his arm on fire. And then it kind of like zooms out and you're watching it through the window of the next scene. Yeah, which is Mr. Barry and his two sons, Paul and Chris, having a discussion about allowing snowboarding on the mountain. I I had to go back and listen to the dialogue again because I was just watching Jim Varney in the background. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. But yeah, Mr. Barry agrees to allow it. But the thing is, Chris has to be in charge of all of it for a two-week trial. And Chris does make a good argument for snowboarding. But putting him in charge of it is that a good idea? He has no discernible skills other than being a good snowboarder. Also, what are you going to learn in two weeks? Yeah. And setting up a race between Chris and skier Jessica. And Jessica wins. What's the, what's the point here? What are we doing here? I don't know what the point of this scene is at all. Yeah. And it gets worse. I think you'll agree with this, too. Because Paul proposes a competition at the end of Chris's two-week probation. Skiers versus snowboarders. The winner determines if snowboarding should be allowed on the mountain. But at the end of the two weeks, wouldn't we know if snowboard snowboarding would be allowed? Because that's the whole point. So it's a completely ridiculous plot element that exists only for more action and no story? Did you find this weird? Well, yeah, because because the the actual two week period could go terribly, and he himself could just be a good snowboarder and win the race. Yeah, exactly. Or he could like, like he thinks Chris is going to fail for the two week probation, and if that is the case, then Paul wins. So why give him another chance? I don't understand. Yeah, and in this situation. Spoiler, you find out that he makes money and is successful, but they still do the race because that was what was agreed upon. It's like, why? You run a resort. Here's an idea that will make you more money. That should be the end of it. Yeah. And it does make more money. So why 
potentially jeopardize yourself into losing everything that you were going to make. I don't think this movie has the strongest plot. No. But at least now you get Rudy in the pro shop trying to uh, get his skis and his gear. Did you like this scene? Uh, it was one of the slower scenes. But he just destroys the place. It's, it's terrible. Will you agree with me that this is terrible? I wouldn't go as far as terrible, but it wasn't, it wasn't good. Will you agree with me that this is Steve Urkel, Family Matters level comedy? No, it wasn't that good. Okay, all right. All right I, I will accept that. So it's now time to build a half pipe and get that Mount Happiness joke spot. So you unnecessary. Go, do you want to go into this? They're building a half pipe. A girl with an accent asks for directions to Mount Happiness, but with her accent, it sounds like Mount a penis. Yep. End of joke. That's it. That's the joke. Once Corey Haim realizes what she's asking, he shows her where it is, and then we move on to the next scene. Yep. That's so stupid. Yep. Um, although I think I found that funnier than Rudy being dragged behind the snowmobile. That's a pointless scene. Dude, most of the scenes are pointless. Rudy in the lookout tower. His music and yodeling disrupting all skiers. Pointless. Why? <laughs> There's so many scenes in this movie where it just feels like they were padding the runtime. Yeah, it really does. Thank you for saying that. Because this this is well, it's not technically one, but this feels like a day in the life movie, kind of like Empire Records, right? Where the entire plot plays out over a day. Here it's like it's two weeks, but feels like two days. Because the passage of time is just non existent here. But Red Eagle 1 is still tearing down flyers, which I find funny. And this is where Mimi recruits him. We are flying through this at a very quick pace. The snowboarders poach Sanjay from ski school, and we get a brief training montage. I think Sanjay is one of the most entertaining characters in the movie. What are your thoughts? He's, he's all right. Who would you put above him? Rudy. <laughs> that, that might be it. Perhaps yeah, you are correct. Exactly. <laughs> oh, that's kind of sad. I know, right? Yeah. Um, Rudy's no skiing on trail nine sign. Where he sticks it in the snow and then falls on it and flies down the hill. At this point, dude, I'm feeling so bad for Jim Bernie. Like... <sighs> I'm feeling really embarrassed because he is earnest. He is one of my favorite characters from films as a child and watching it. It's, it's kind of like watching Leslie Nielsen get into worse and worse parody films. Did you get that vibe? No. No, you just loved him in this? No, I mean, like, Leslie Nielsen's bad parody movies were still somewhat entertaining. After after wrongfully accused, I felt like he just needed money. Yeah, I still don't think this is even on those levels. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Sanjay does all of the recruiting for the snowboarders to save them? Why? How? And snowboarding just catches on because of it. Again, why? How? The plot to this movie makes no sense. It must have been that half pipe that they built with shovels. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up, too. <laughs> oh, my God. The whole thing is so dumb. They put that half pipe together real quick. <laughs> yeah. So Mimi wants all of uh, Mr. Barry's money. We've established this. Why does she think that Red Eagle One is smart enough to not just formulate a plan to do so, but successfully execute it? Plot convenience. I think we're dying on this movie, man, because, yeah, there's not a lot to even try to explain. It just doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. Red Eagle might be the worst person for her to recruit. Uh, he is the worst. The absolute worst. There is no reason to believe that he is 
competent enough to do anything. So we just get snowboarding montages. And honestly, it kind of makes me want to get back on the hills. But, you know, winter is coming. They're just desperate to fill the runtime of this movie. And it's not a long film. It's under an hour and a half, as is. <laughs> there might be a solid 40 minutes of a movie in this. <laughs> I don't even know if there's that much. What's your thought on Rudy being stuck on the mountain after trying to snowboard and just falling over? He's there for most of the day and into the night. Just take the fucking board off, man. <laughs> That's all you have to do. He's got a small pile of snow on him. <laughs> One half of him. He can't get out of that. Well, the, the thing is, like, when he falls over, he's on his back. So he tries to kip up for some reason and be like, why don't you just sit up and stand? Now you're going to roll into your stomach and then flip over again and try and kip up again and it's not going to work. Just either sit up and stand or, or just undo the bindings and walk away. Well, that doesn't make any sense. What also, like, what doesn't make sense is then we just cut to the snowboarders having a party, which is standard teen movie party fair, and it does nothing for the rest of the story. It's, again, filler. Now, the next scene I would love to really get into. Okay. Red Eagle is cleaning Mr. Barry's office while Barry's on the phone with the insurance company. Did you read the bank notice that Red Eagle 1 sees on the desk. No, I, I saw that it said bank notice, but I didn't actually get to see any of the, the body details, and I didn't care enough to, like, rewind and pause. Okay. Dude, this is the worst thing I've ever seen for a letter in a movie. Okay. I have transcribed most of it. Oof. This letter has for per puce to encourage you to pay us back the, one word, full amount of money, one word, that you owe us. After, lowercase a, 30 days after, again. <laughs> so after 30 days after the reception of this letter, if you didn't pay the full amount of $2 million, we will have O choice but to seize S E I S E, the ski resort named Chanticleer. The next three words are spelled D J R T G E T J U O O F F L. And it's gibberish for the rest of the letter. <laughs> I don't what? know if this is intentional. What? <laughs> But it's full on center of the screen. I paused it. I'm like, this can't be an accident. It has to be a joke. The conflict is with the insurance. Why would you even have a bank notice? There? I don't know. I appreciate it. Did Red Eagle write this? No, he bumps into the desk and looks and he's reading it like, oh, wow, he's in, he's in deep. And then we just cut to a sing-along with Rudy at the bar. Um, Paul and Dennis. I kind of like their conversation. Paul just shitting on his brother and his father's decisions and fallacies. And we get a, a fun back and forth that I like, but you obviously will hate. Dennis being like, it's that soft spot that made him adopt you two kids. And hey, if it wasn't for him, I probably would have ended up behind bars. No, it wasn't bad. <laughs> but it's Paul's reaction of, what are you, a comedian? He's like, well, apparently not. He tried. That's good. That's good writing. But he's also the writer, so fuck him for taking one of the best lines. Mr. Barry shows up and tries to talk to Paul. And Paul's fear is about Chris getting a chance to prove the snowboarding idea. Another question for you. When I watched this in the 90s, I thought Paul was the good guy. Are we actually supposed to like Paul? No, I think he's uh, like a red herring antagonist. Who is the main character of this movie? Uh, Chris? He's got less screen time than anyone else, it seems. But if you just analyze the plot, 
he's the one that's trying to make something of himself after being a slacker, bring extra money to the mountain, which in turn yeah. might save it from the insurance. Structurally, but, he seems like the main character, but they don't use him as such. No, because Jim Varney's on screen more, but he's obviously the side character. Hames in there a bit and is integral to the plot. Same with Bridget Nielsen, who we see maybe five times. Joe Flaherty, we see a fair amount, but he's not the lead. Paul Hopkins as Paul Barry. I don't know. I, I think we picked a movie that doesn't have a lead. I don't know if we've ever seen that before. But the next day, apparently two weeks has passed because it's skiers versus snowboarders. Paul Stanley. It has to be a kiss reference. From the insurance company, anyway. He arrives to inspect the resort. First race, Sanjay versus an Olympic skier. How? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Nobody noticed that she doesn't belong. <laughs> Sanjay immediately recognized her as an Olympic skier, but somehow nobody else does? Yeah. Paul has obviously called in favors that he has somehow that are never explained. Um, I did enjoy Sanjay dropping the line, Bogley Totus. I thought that was pretty funny. Um, next note, straight up just says, fucking Red Eagle 1, dude. Obviously trying to sabotage things, but wearing the weirdest full face blue head ski mask thing I've ever seen. He looks like a cartoon character. He's the worst. But the fact that he's trying to light a cigarette and can't get it through the, the mouth hole, so he tries the nose and can't, and pulls the mask down, gets it into the eye hole, lights it, and the mask just shoots back up. So he's got a lit cigarette in the mask. He's fighting to get it out, slapping himself in the face. It falls out of his nose. He starts coughing and then just spits in the mask. I don't know how you didn't laugh here, because I thought the acting was top-notch. I will laugh at that scene every time I see it. Sure. I, I see you really enjoy this movie. I can't wait to hear your final thoughts and recommendations. I'll tell you right now, Red Eagle sucks. The race begins. All right. Sanjay's in the lead somehow, but Red Eagle takes him out with a giant rolling snowball, which makes no sense. <sighs> but we get a great victory dance, which I thought was great. You obviously hate. So we'll quickly move on to the next competition, where Slush versus a World Cup champion. And I have to say, it's been a long time since I've heard the term knuckle dragger, and I can't believe they got away with it in this movie. But that was a term used for us snowboarders back in the day. Have you ever heard that? Uh, no, not, not for snowboarders. Yeah, it's, well, it's because when you're, when you're leading into turns, more often than not, you're going to have a hand touch the snow. Sure. If they were prepared for any shenanigans and said that it would even disqualify them, how did nobody acknowledge this giant boulder of a snowball? It knocks Sanjay out entirely, and nobody's like, oh, maybe there was some inappropriate conduct here. Yeah. They act like only a few people spotted it. It's a giant ball. Well, I mean, that kind of goes along with what happens here. Because Slush gets flash photography in his face. And then Red Eagle turns on the snow machines. But Slush still pulls off an amazing performance. There's no way anybody could possibly have seen him do any of these moves. The hill's so steep. He's off course. There's no one around, but he nails it. Like, it is impossible. People aren't seeing what they should, and they're seeing what they shouldn't. It makes yeah. zero they, sense. They especially shouldn't be able to see him because they should see the snow from the snow machine that shouldn't be on. Exactly. <sighs> it doesn't get any better, man. No, no, it doesn't. Thoughts on the scenes with the insurance inspector? Stuck on the ski lift. Sprayed with the snowmaker. The meeting with Rudy. Did any of this work for you? No, not even remotely. Did any of it irritate you? Um, 
Not any more so, I guess. Are you just waiting for the movie to be over? At this point, yeah. When I was watching it, I was just waiting for the credits at this point. Well, we're not too far off. The snowboarders catch Paul at the switches for the snowmaker. And it makes it look like he was the one sabotaging everything. Of course, this leads the brothers to challenge each other. Except then everyone pieces together that Mimi's behind everything with absolutely no proof. <laughs> what proof do they need? Exactly. Rudy accidentally accurately predicts that somebody is on Trail 9, and of course it's Mimi. So he sets off on a snowboard. And somehow he can move now. We don't know how he can keep his balance, how he stays upright, but it's integral to the plot. They're just throwing plot at us now, because we get Chris versus Paul. Gordo takes out Red Eagle. Mimi tosses dynamite, which Rudy ends up with, and he throws it, it explodes, Red Eagle gets sent down the rocks in a great use of a dummy. But what are we doing here? <laughs> Why is any of this happening? Jessica spots Mimi making snowballs? For what purpose? <laughs> snowballs are um, dangerous and sneaky. She must be the culprit. The insurance inspector agrees to keep insuring the resort as long as they keep Rudy, the hero, on staff. Fine. Then we jump back to Mimi, who goes into the pro shop and starts hurling snowballs at Tori, then starts a ski pole fight with Jessica, pulls a boot rack down on top of her, tries to grind her face on some sort of weird sharpener or belt sander. That would have been, like, fatal. <laughs> exactly, like, what are we doing here? <laughs> Just murder the girl. Jessica punches her out. And the insurance inspector calls Mimi out on the dynamite antics. Maybe the police should do that. <laughs> I don't know. But she gets arrested and signs the divorce papers fine. Please explain to me this part. Red Eagle one's on a gurney and Dennis ties him to the back of an ambulance which drives away. The comedy. Why did the first responders even leave him there? <laughs> they wheeled him up to the back and then got inside and drove away. Yep. Yep. And then a really weird quote. We get... <laughs> it's not do you know what I'm talking better. about? No. Well, I probably will remember when you tell me. It's Rudy and his fourth wall break. Everyone's going partying. He's like, it's all fun and games until someone loses an eye. But hey... When someone loses an eye around here, the party's just beginning. Cut to a snowboard montage and roll credits, and the fucking movie is over. <laughs> the fuck did we just watch? What was that shit? I remember loving this movie, and I'm so confused. I'm so fucking confused. I feel like the writers had a series of jokes and individual scenes that they thought were funny and were like, all right, now let's build a movie around this, because that's the way you do it. It has to be the case, right? <laughs> that's what it feels like. Because there are a lot of really funny lines in the movie, and there's not a lot of funny scenes. The movie just but doesn't flow well as a movie. It, it no. doesn't. It doesn't at all. You're right. It's so broken. And I, I really don't think anybody had fun making this movie. <laughs> Except for James Salisco as Dennis. Maybe? I guess. Probably the only one. Like, Jim Varney is doing his best. Corey Haim is present. Bridget Nielsen doesn't give a shit, you can tell. Joe Flaherty looks embarrassed. Andreas uh, Apergis, 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 as uh, Red Eagle One, he's fucking trying. He's really trying. Paul Hopkins as Paul Barry, also trying. Other than that, people are just getting paid, you can tell. And not very much. No, because... It, it can't be. I couldn't find a hard number on what the budget was. I found the estimated budget. And it's going to be a lot more than you think it is. It's, it's not a lot of money but more than you think this movie could have been made for. Okay. Care to take a guess? 1.5 million. 
2.8. No. <laughs> I'm I'm hoping 2.7 of that went to Jim Varney. No. Uh, give 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 a couple hundred thousand to Haim. He needed it. But 2.8 million for this man. It's pretty much filmed in in Montreal on an actual ski resort. But I mean they also did some some pickup stuff in California. The gross I'm not even going to make a guess because I couldn't find it. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what it was. <laughs> Less than 2.8 million. Definitely. Probably the amount I spent on buying the VHS. Oh, man, I can't believe you own the VHS. I, it's Corey Haim. I'm going to have to own it somehow. <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Uh, going into the ratings, IMDB, what do you think people gave it out of 10? 3.7. You generous bastard. <laughs> 2.5. Okay, I wasn't that far off. Yeah. What do you think about the uh, percentage of uh, positive reviews on uh, Rotten Tomatoes from the critics for the tomato meter? Not applicable. There are none. You are correct. <laughs> Guarantee that I, once they started documenting this, no one went back and reviewed this. No. The audience score, how many positive reviews percentage wise? 17. 28. <sighs> That's 28% is the best stat this movie has. That's a, it's one of the lowest rated movies or recommended movies we've done, I believe. Yeah. I went into this movie thinking I loved it. We'll get to it. <laughs> but. For now, let's go to our awards. <laughs> okay, who did you have as your least favorite character? I think that we won't have any agreement on any of these awards. Okay. For me, my least favorite character was Slush. I hated the overdone stoner stereotype with stoner subtitles. I thought the acting was terrible. I don't think he needed to be in the movie. It was a waste of time, and I wanted him out. You? Ben, who was my least favorite character? Red Eagle One. Yeah. Care to provide an explanation? I've already explained. I'm just going to be retreading the same ground here. This guy was just annoying. Okay. I wish I could give you more. I don't have anything else. That's fine. Who's your favorite? Come on, man. You know who my favorite was. Rudy James, Jim Varney. Rudy James, the the legit only saving grace to this movie. Okay. I mean, we've covered why Jim Varney is so good in this. He's so good. Yeah. He's so good. I mean, there's so few. I loved him already, but this movie just reinforced the fact that I think he could be given any material and make it entertaining just by his delivery alone. Yeah. Well, he was a genius. and. A talent unlike anyone we've ever seen. He just had a knack about him that could just make you smile. Yeah. Xander, who's my favorite character? I, I'd have to guess it's Red Eagle. Yeah, Red Eagle 1, you were correct. I don't know how. So I thought he was fucking hilarious. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Go back to Cypress Hill. No. <sighs> favorite or most memorable line? Um, probably the least memorable for you, but I mentioned it, uh, basically when he was there for his, uh, interview slash job reporting scene, um, when Red Eagle one, uh, radios, Paul or head cheese, it's the way Jim Varney goes head cheese and the look on his face. I will never forget that line ever. It's really dumb. For some reason, that stands out more than anything else anybody said in this movie. But what's yours? So it's actually Dennis. Oh, and it okay. is um, the scene where uh, Rudy is trying to entertain and Mimi is in the bar just giving him a hard time. <laughs> and when he first walks off the stage and walks to the bar, uh, Dennis says to him, interesting concept there, Rudy James. Comedy, but without all that annoying laughter. <laughs> and it's just complimented by Rudy replying in like the most normal way. Like it's very non Rudy type 
delivery on this line, but in a very like straight laced character way, just says, "Yeah, I've been working on it for years." <laughs> <laughs> he he had some really good lines, or maybe it was the delivery more so than the actual written word. So I and I think that that's why this was highlighted so much is the delivery on that line was the most like dejected because it seemed to completely sap the personality out of Rudy, which is normally stupid, but positive, enthusiastic yeah. to just like a, uh, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing type thing. And it's just like, it really, it really put a spotlight on it. See, yeah. Okay. I'm glad you brought that up because we saw that a couple of times here. Like when they throw a comment at him and he's walking off stage, he's like, yeah, no shit. And then when he talks to Dennis at the bar for that one second, he, there's no humor in what he's doing. He seems genuine, like a very serious, somewhat broken individual. And then a line like that that you just delivered. I, I really wanted to see more of that. If, if we saw that real dark side to Rudy to juxtapose the slapstick element, he would 100% be my favorite character. But I felt like we were robbed because we lost out on Jim Varney delivering a complex character in a comedy that could really use some grounded personality. Uh, memorable scene? <laughs> it was this, the sound check. Yeah. <laughs> the first sound check is just Rudy at his absolute best. Yeah. Yeah. It's very good. Very, very good. Going back and watching it for the second time, like it's it's impossible not to laugh. Um, I've got I hate to say two, but I have to say every time I see the opening montage of like the Satan flips and everything. I, I remember that specifically because of how I broke my face. And it, it hurts to think about. But I always think about that when I think about this movie. But if you want to talk about favorite scene, it's Rudy's arm on fire. <laughs> That's really good, too. <laughs> Him running all over the place is fucking Jim Varney, man. What a legend. He's he was better fantastic. than to be in this movie. He really did. He really, really did. Final thoughts on Snowboard Academy? <sighs> um, I, I really like this movie. It is horrendous. It is not that funny, except for Jim Varney. I love Corey Haim. And when he's on screen, he's great. But he's barely on screen. It's a slog to get through. I would never recommend this movie to anybody ever. I'm embarrassed that I picked it and made you watch it because this is not the movie I remembered enjoying in 1997. Uh, it is awful. I, I will say right now, this is the worst movie we have reviewed on this show. And to anybody listening who watched the movie in anticipation, for this episode, I, I cannot apologize enough for making you do that. To anybody who watched this movie in preparation to listening to this show and enjoyed it, hit me up. We probably have some pretty fun conversation. <laughs> this movie is atrocious. Sandro, what are your final thoughts on, on Snowboard Academy? Yeah, this isn't a good movie, man. Um... I think the nicest thing I can say about it is that I didn't hate watching it. It's not a good movie by any measure, but it's not like it's inoffensive. Like, yeah, I had no problem yeah. watching it, but just the biggest feeling I had coming out of it, like, was that whole why? Why did any of this happen? Why did I watch this movie? Like, I'm so neutral on it that it's just like, I'll forget this movie even existed after I post this episode. But I didn't hate it. So it's like, all right, I guess it's got that going for it. On the plus side, at least, you know, at least we had Rudy James. Those scenes at least made it somewhat enjoyable and entertaining. But as a movie as a whole, it's like, it's just 
here. It's deflating. It's just here. Yeah. It exists. Yeah. On my VHS shelf. <laughs> That's not a good place for a movie to be. L love or hate, at least you can get some emotional drive out of it. This movie is just here. A few laughs. You know, Jim Varney. And then that's it. Yeah. Then it's just over. That's it. Like, the movie ends and you're just like, I can definitely say I watched a movie. That's about it. Yeah. Yeah, I spent an hour and 28 minutes watching something that was filmed. I should have just watched Out Cold. Or Ski School. I don't think I've seen Ski School. All right. Well, those are our thoughts on Snowboard Academy. <laughs> oh, God. You're so <laughs> terrible. What the fuck did I do to you? Oh, I'm so sorry. Again, I'm not, I'm not mad about it. It just was. If you guys want to share your thoughts with us, <laughs> if you actually watch Snowboard Academy, <laughs> hit us up on social media. We are on Twitter at BS Bargain Bin, Facebook.com slash BS Bargain Bin, BS Bargain Bin .com, and of course the comment section at YouTube.com slash at BS Bargain Bin. Ben. Before, before, you, before you even ask me, this is the one movie we've talked about where we didn't try and make it better. We just let it die. <laughs> We're like, it's, it's hopeless. Just, just don't even worry about it. Hey, we wanted a palate cleanser from the type of kind of more serious action and horror movies we've been doing recently. And this definitely was that. Uh, no, I don't think it was so much a palate cleanser. It was a salt lick. <laughs> it still served the same purpose. <laughs> oh, shit. So this is what you did to us this week. What's happening to us next week? Well, next week, it wasn't up to us at all. Uh, next week, we are doing our September. Wow, I can't believe it. Listener pick. Uh, coming from Zero Valen, we are talking 1986's Big Trouble in Little China. This is Jack Burton in the Pork Chop Express, and I'm talking to whoever's listening out there. It's a pretty amazing planet we live on here, and a man would have to be some kind of fool to think we're all alone in this universe. There is a hidden world where ancient evil weaves a modern mystery. What's going on here? Is it some kind of... Magic. The darkest magic. Ow! Oh. They call it Little China. Finally, we shall bring order out of chaos. It's where big trouble was waiting for Jack Burton. Who? Jack Burton. Me. Jack. Jack. Jack! They told him to go to hell. He make one move. And that's just where he's going. Somebody, I don't care who, tell me what is going on. How are you going to spring us? I have no idea. There are many mysteries, many unanswerable questions, even in a life as short as yours. <coughs> My destiny rests in your capable hands. Hey, I'll do my best. Ah! Oh, God, is this really happening? This is gonna take Cracker Jack timing, Wang. One, two, three. We may be trapped. Total concentration. Safety. Huh, yeah. You ready, Jack? I was born ready. Way to go, Jack. Jack Burton's coming to rescue your summer. Hey, what more can a guy ask for? 20th Century Fox presents Kurt Russell 
in John Carpenter's Big Trouble in Little China. It's on the reflexes. Until next week, have a good one. All the best.